Well, we're privileged tonight to host Pulitzer Prize winning author and currently sitting U.S. Poet Laureate. Please welcome the Plotus, Tracy K. Smith. I, w I was pleased to, to discover in the archives that Bob Dylan apparently did that old spiritual back in, I think, in the 1960, 1961. But I understand that this um, spiritual, obviously, was uh, inspiration for your new book entitled Wade in the Water. So tell us about that. Oh, absolutely. I'd been working on poems that were thinking about history and thinking about, you know, America in the 21st century. And then I uh, took a trip to coastal Georgia and I attended a ring shout where this uh, song was performed. And even before the performance began, one of the women, her name is Bertha McKnight, greeted me and everyone else that she came into contact with that night by saying, I love you, and giving a hug. And it felt so real. It set the tone for the really powerful performance. And I, I came back, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and I wanted to kind of dive into that feeling a little bit more by writing a poem. Yeah. Um, you, you clearly, in a, in a recent interview in New York Times Magazine, you had this line where you said uh, that you want a poem to unsettle something. You said there's a deep and interesting kind of troubling that poems do. Talk to us about that. Well, I love, uh, you know, we're drawn to reflect on powerful experiences um, because there's something we don't necessarily feel that we've tapped, right? And if I'm writing a poem, I want to unearth something that I haven't gotten my head around yet. Sometimes it's just a, an abundant kind of joy. Other times, or oftentimes, it's a, something that's a little bit darker, something that um, shakes me out of an easy sense of certainty that I might have, something that shows me there's a different and stranger way of looking at something. You, um, it, it does seem that in your current collection that you have these poems that on the one hand are, are very disturbing, uh, that would stir up all sorts of kind of socio-political uh, questions. Um, and yet on the other hand, you seem to, uh, especially with one that, uh, that you're gonna do later tonight, you seem to be looking for ways of reconciliation and common ground. So how, how do you hold both of those things together in your work? Well, I think it it's just speaks to the capacity of art to allow us a vocabulary and even a sense of courage for facing the real mm -hmm. in all of its troubling dimensions. And also, it, it urges us to draw upon the kinds of resources that we have um, to confront that, yeah. you know, live with it in a way that's productive. And so in this work, Wade in the Water, you, you went back and worked out of real historical sources and, and fashioned that into your lines, right? Yeah, I, um, I was listening to voices from um, mostly America's antebellum history and trying to find something that could be useful today, something that might urge me to think or us to think differently about questions of difference, questions of race and fear that we haven't really f resolved, I don't think. As and and in the, in, uh, I will tell you the truth about this. I will tell you all about it. Um, you're using excerpts actually from depositions of veterans. Is that right? Yeah. The war. Uh, so these would have been former slaves who, who fought, fought in the war. In the Civil War. And then after the war, sometimes well into the 20th century, uh, were petitioning to get the pensions that as veterans they should have been mm. entitled to. Yeah. Um, Would you share us? Uh, share sure. With us, uh, one of those? Um, so that's a, a poem that's really comprised of statements and letters. So I'll read you two letters. Um, this one is from Nashville, Tennessee, August 12th, 1865. Dear wife, I am in earnest about you coming and that as soon as possible. It is no use to say anything about any money. For if you come up here, which I hope you will, it will be all right as to the money matters. I want to see you and the children very bad. I can get a house at any time I will say the word, so you need not to fear as to that. So come, right on, just as soon as you get this. I want you to tell me the name of the baby that was born since I left. I am your affectionate husband until death. And the reply that came from Clarksville uh, on August 28th says, Dear husband, I guess you would like to know the reason why that I did not come when you wrote for. 
and that is because I had not the money and could not get it. And if you will send me the money or come after me, I will come. They sent out soldiers from here after old Riley, and they have got him in jail and one of his sons, and they have his brother Elias here in jail. Dear husband, if you are coming after me, I want you to come before it get too cold. I, I was particularly moved also by um, the piece in the work, The Greatest Personal Privation. And in, in, in this one, you're working not out of um, documentary sources, but you are reflecting upon a historical incident and yet kind of imagining what... Uh, what the players were saying, is that, is that right? Yeah, um, so, you know, there's, I, I felt lucky to find those letters and depositions that documented the experience of black soldiers during and after the war, but there's so much that went undocumented. And um, I found in a really wonderful history called Dwelling Place by Erskine Clark, a series of letters that were written back and forth um, by the Charles Colcock Jones family, who was a slaveholding family. Um, letters in which they were trying to decide what to do with a family that they held uh, enslaved that had been causing some problems. And they were trying to decide, should we sell them? What should we do? Um, there was only one letter that was written by a member of that family that survived. And um, in it, she says, well, we were sold. This is, um, this is who is doing what. This is who survived. But I, I really wanted to hear more from that, that side of the equation. And so what I did was kind of an act of like, willful imagining, where I took the language from the Jones family's letters, and I tried to listen almost underneath that text for the voices of um, people like Patience or Phoebe, members of that family of, of people that were held um, in bondage to them. I'll read you a couple sections of that poem. It is a painful and harassing business belonging to her. We have had trouble enough, have no comfort or confidence in them, and they appear unhappy themselves, no doubt from the trouble they have occasioned. They could dispose of the whole family without consulting us. Father, mother, every good cook, washer, and seamstress subject to sale. I believe good shall be glad if we may have hope of the loss of trouble. I remain in glad conscience, at peace with God and the world. I have prayed for those people many many, very many times. In every probability, we may yet discover the whole country will not come back from the sale of parent and child. So far as I can see, the loss is great and increasing. I know they have desired we should not know what was for our own good, but we cannot be all the cause of all that has been done. Miss Tracy K. Smith. Thanks. <laughs>